It's been a while, but we're back to looking at Final Fantasy XIV job lore with Blue Mage. Big, weird gimmick, but as much as we're going to be talking about that in its history, spells, and story, it's on the block because it's been requested in the comments. And fair enough, we're going to its homeland in a few months, might as well. Quick spoiler warning, we're going to be talking all about Blue Mage's job quest. There are spells that spoil things, but we aren't going to be talking about them, so you're going to be safe there. If you like this, do YouTube things with likes and subscribes, and with that, let's get to it. Blue Mage was first introduced in Final Fantasy V, and right out the gate it had its whole identity. You get spells from enemies when they use them on you. In fact, pretty much all of Blue Mage comes from V, because most of its iconic spells start there too. Goblin Punch, Mighty Guard, White Wind, Revenge, the level targeting spells like Level 5 Death, Self Destruct. Pretty much every series entry from 5 until 11 had a Blue Mage of some kind. Pretty much all of them with the same skill set, although sometimes the magic itself was more of a limit break. But very few of them share any aesthetic or thematic notes. There's one thing shared by almost every single incarnation, though. With the single exception of the enemy skill materia in Final Fantasy VII Remake, not even Rebirth, every instance of Blue Mage is broken as hell if you put the effort in. Yes, even Kamari. It's just that sometimes the game's too easy to make that worth it. Specifically, 14 borrows its Blue Mage aesthetic from 5, but there's some nods to its more tribalist leanings that you saw in 6, 10, and kinda 9. In the world of 14, blue magic is a product of the Walki tribe of Turol. Although it's not quite right to call them blue mages. Blue magic as we understand it is actually an adaptation from their skills by Martin. Sort of fitting it into an Eorzean framework. It's one of only two jobs in the game that's newly established, so the Soul Crystal's not etched with the past deeds of previous owners. Now, normally, when I do job lore videos, I go into the equipment and abilities of the job, and then the storyline. But this time, I think it's right to go the other way around. Our introduction to Blue Mage doesn't exactly come conventionally. We're asked by the Yellow Jackets to look into someone claiming to be a Blue Mage, a style of mage that nobody's even heard of before, trying to hawk their wares. Suspecting the guy to be a scam artist selling total snake oil, they ask us to investigate, leading us to meet Martin and find out that, well yeah, this guy is a scam artist, but that's just because he's fixing the demonstrations alongside some mamulja he's travelling with. The wares are real. Martin travelled to Torol, then known as the New World, and learn the magical techniques of the Wallachy tribe, which he's then adapted. You heard me a minute or two ago. By the way, I'm going to try to count every single unique spell Martin uses. We're at six so far just in this introduction quest. We test this for ourselves as instructed, and it works. Apparently, the big problem is just that Eorzeans don't read instructions. The whole display catches the eye of the other long-term player in the story. Royce, an up-and-coming entrepreneur from Oldar, and she sees money in this. No, she sees a performance in this. So, she hires Martin and ourselves to build a whole combat skill exhibition out of it. And that's not ready yet, but the first thing in order is Martin's getting a new title and makeover. He's now the Great Azuro, Starfighter in the Celestium's Masked Carnivale promotion. Because it turns out, this whole thing is kind of a riff on professional wrestling. Yeah, we're real, but we're putting on one hell of a show. I wanted to keep up that message, so I thought I should glam appropriately. For this video, I based my character's glam on Japanese wrestler Maki Ito. Yeah, I know it's not perfect, but unless you're the Rogomaniac, you are just accepting good enough when it comes to wrestling cosplays. We start off our Blue Mage journey with what looks like a 1 to 50 standard, basically doing little chores to show we're learning the job we're doing. But very quickly, it becomes clear that Martin's using us as an excuse to make some money, and that he's being extorted for an illicit substance, dream flowers, which it turns out he's getting as part of a medicine for a disease that he and his expedition accidentally gave the Wallachy. 
even when there isn't colonialism with Native American fantasy analogues, we still have to hit all of the colonialist problems. Especially because, at the same time, we're also learning about another person who travelled there with Martin, Wastrak. He's entirely profit-minded, and while he dismissed Blue Mage as pretty worthless for that after he learned it, he's instead got his eyes on the massive ceruleum deposit that the Wallachy are damn near literally sleeping on. This is why there's some assumption that the Wallachy might live in or near the Dawn Trail Zone Shiloani. Feeling guilty over her own involvement in this, Royce proposes an exhibition match between us and Wastrak over control of the Wallachy's lands. And she's not one to let an exhibition match go on without some flair, as Wastrak gets his own in-ring persona. Martin is the great Azuro. We're Azuro II. And Wastrak brings our final theme of the storyline, a running conga line of glop shittos from across the franchise. Weirdo minor bosses that don't make sense anywhere else and a lot of people barely remember. Wastrak's persona is Azul Magia, an optional boss from Final Fantasy V, whose whole gimmick is that he's a blue mage like we could be. He's actually the only one of this parade of weirdos that was a serious boss in the original game he's from. We win, and Wastra keeps to his word and gives up. This happens a lot too. Every story ends in a fight, and then they just go, Well, you win. I'll play ball. Oh, and also, Royce finds a more legal way to handle the Dreamflower situation, so that's all sorted. Don't worry, everyone. Vince McMahon fixed smallpox. In the Heaven's Ward level range, we see that Martin's properly started a Blue Mages Guild, with at least two students, Nutiba and Piandi. Both of which he is ripping off, because even now Martin's poor as shit. Because as fancy as the Masked Carnivale is, it isn't the level of rich most of Old Isle's attractions are. But that's due to change, because Royce is courting a new investor. Fiergeis, head of the Armagina and Sons Mineral Concern. Bit of history, Fiergeis has been a visible member of the Syndicate since 1.0. But outside of a single line in the Miner's job quest line, this is the first time he's been given any actual story presence. Royce thinks she's got him pretty desperate, because while the mineral concern brings in a tidy profit, after Teleji's death, he is by far the weakest link in the Syndicate, and he wants some extra income streams. And while the Blue Mages are the least interesting part of the Carnivale to him, he's still pretty interested. Incidentally, this is where we learn as a clear stated fact that the Thaumaturgist Guild summons and binds Void Scent as a regular thing, mostly for demonstrative purposes. But, on the subject of Blue Mages, Martin shows off a few new spells he's learned, which somehow includes a spell you can only learn from Sophia, which means that Martin is terrifyingly legit even when he's broke. This brings him up to nine spells too. Unfortunately, not Everyone in this storyline is legit, as soon enough, Fiergeist's plan is made clear. He wants to buy up the Carnivale not as a business venture for its own sake, but as a glorified recruitment scheme for his Stone Torch's security force. Their commander, his son Zernberg, fights in the Colosseum under the name Siegfried, and Fiergeist's plan is to have Siegfried kick the arse of these highfalutin blue mages to act as a big publicity drive. In pro wrestling comparisons, businessmen trying to use it as sort of a reputation laundering like this has happened a few times both in and out of the ring. It's never been exactly like this, but it's why Donald Trump was at WrestleMania that one time. Siegfried is the next in our lineup of weird minor pulls though. In Final Fantasy VI, Siegfried was a legendary treasure hunter that you see a couple times across the game, who's just not quite as good as he builds himself up to be. Maybe because the one we see across the story is a fake, with the real one being a fairly legit fight in that game's Colosseum. All that's still not quite the end of Fiergeist's bullshit though, as first we find out that his plan isn't just to use the Carnivale as a big PR opportunity, he also has plans to use its menagerie of beasts as an attack force against threats to his mining operations, which would free up his stone torches for more important work. That grabs Martin's attention though. He wants to prove blue mages as legit out in real combat. 
This turns into a wager on his exhibition match against Siegfried, which Martin's pretty confident about. Because for as good as his opponent is in a melee range, he doesn't really have a long range plan. Fitting for the job with Sonic Boom, Martin's gonna zone the guy out. Which looks like a great idea! Until he turns up Strag with a bunch of Garlean tech, including a fucking grenade launcher! Martin scrapes out a near stalemate, thanks to both Mighty Guard and Self Destruct, 14 spells now, which is enough for Siegfried to demand a second round, which goes to us. We win, which leads to things working out. For how much they're willing to backstab on the setup, Zernberg and Feargeist are men of their word when put in their place. Stormblood's level range brings us a very similar situation. The Guild and Carnivale are both looking good, Royce is bringing some potential investors around, but there's two little twists. First, Nutib is just straight up gone, he's left without warning, and while Piande is stepping up to become a new Azuro, it's a cloud hanging over people's heads. And second, the investors fall through because they're from the Far East and apparently Kugane's got a suspiciously similar attraction. The Fukumen Fighting Festival. We've got the rival slash foreign promotion. Fortunately, in the real world, foreign promotions can be pretty friendly with each other, mostly because they don't actually have to compete. All Elite Wrestling and New Japan Wrestling do a lot of stuff together, it doesn't really get as vicious as we'll see in this storyline. But naturally, this warrants an investigation, one that Martin goes on himself, only to get swindled out of everything he owned by Gyodo, the same Namazu that tried to rip us off back in Stormblood. We head over to help, and in the process, we learn about the three major figures of the fighting festival. First of all, all dialogue seems to suggest that, rather than being a bunch of scheduled bouts, the fighting festival is some sort of regular tournament, but there's no real indication of how it's actually structured. Its owner is Kageyama, an amoral Hingen businessman who'd previously been in the Stormblood Allied Tribe quest. We'd later see him in Tartaru's Endwalker questline, and as the guy running one of the Crystal Conflict maps. Second, Blue Hood, who's actually Nutiba having stolen a bunch of Martin's stuff, including his business pitch, who's actually a Lamintzen sailor that got blackmailed into doing Kageyama's bidding to protect his fiance. And finally, the Golden Goliath, the other major blue wizard of the fighting festival, despite not even wearing the right colours. It's time for Martin's exhibition match of the expansion, as he reasons that as good as the Goliath is at his skills, he seems to have only learned from the beasts of the fighting festival itself, so he's probably under-equipped. But for as good as Martin's show of expertise is, which by the way brings him up to 17 spells, Goliath blindsides him, cracking out blue, white, and black magic, which is just unheard of. This is thoroughly unprecedented, and in preparing for a rematch, this time on our home turf, thanks to Royce getting involved, we head to Yangsha to try to figure things out. Turns out the Golden Goliath's a longtime fixture of the community, a local street performer since even before the Empire rolled in, beloved for his mimicry. Back then, he wasn't the Golden Goliath, though. His real name is... Yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. I do think it's intentional, though. This was planned and released between Golden Wind and Stone Ocean's anime adaptations, so yeah, they probably did mean it. Gogo himself, though, was a bonus gimmick boss in Final Fantasy V, and a hidden party member in VI. In V, he protected the Mimic Job Crystal, with the gimmick being that because he'd mimic everything you did, you'd win by mimicking him. So by doing nothing for a minute or two, which 14's Gogo does at the start of his fight. 14's Gogo, post makeover, does seem to be visually based on 6's Gogo, although there's some elements of 5, that cloak around the shoulders, for example. Once we beat him, Kageyama gets real pissed, but calls for a best 2 out of 3. Which he immediately loses, because Royce lured him to Aldar, where he could get arrested for his smuggling operation. This also frees up Nutiba's fiancé, and ostensibly both Nutiba and Gogo from servitude under Kageyama. But Nutiba feels like he should come clean and do right with a branch of the Blue Mages Guild, and Gogo respects a good imitation. So, they're gonna keep up the fighting festival, they're just going to be honest about its origins. And finally, at least so far, 
we have the Shadowbringers level ranges storyline. Where, for once, the Carnivale isn't facing an external problem, unless you count audience fatigue as external. Their show has just become pretty stale to the audience, they're not coming to regular shows. But it doesn't take long for the solution to become clear. They need to diversify the ticket. It's a classic pro wrestling problem, you can't just keep having Hulk Hogan beating people every night. It's gonna get boring. So, most of the storyline is talent scouting time. Which means, the storyline doesn't just bring us the glup shittos of the rest of the series, we start getting the game's own. First, Thraktum, the compulsive liar from the Titan Quest line, turns up posing as the legendary Mist Beard's right hand man, only to get completely trounced by Martin, who's now up to an even 20 spells, including a couple we could only learn on the first. After Gridania turns out to be a bit of a dead end, we head to Ishgard for a match against a fan favorite Fate NPC, a lame bird of the spiked butt, which Martin actually has to face without blue magic because apparently a previous blue mage in Ishgard's arena was just too shameful, mostly thanks to Flying Sardine. After some struggling though, Martin reveals his greatest secret, that he really is legit, and that it's not unheard of to use blue, black, and white magic, because he's been able to do it the whole time. These aren't blue mage spells though, so we won't up the count. But this changes the plan. Rather than search for a good nemesis for Martin, Royce comes up with the idea of having him play the heel to our face, using a bunch of Magitech to give him a whole new persona. Goldor! Maybe the weirdest boss fool of the storyline, Goldor was a diversion in Final Fantasy III, a man who owned a solid gold mansion full of solid gold ornaments, including a solid gold rock that was mistaken for the Earth Crystal. Gonna come clean though, I haven't actually managed to beat Goldor yet, so while I can tell you that this works to revitalize the Carnivale, I can't actually show you that it does. So here's where I normally talk about the equipment and abilities, but here's the thing about Blue Mage. Normally, when I make a job lore video, I've got a handful of weapons and a description of the job gear, but we've barely got weapons and armor to talk about here. In fact, I can summarize it all right now that the starting gear was made on the cheap by artists that Martin ripped off, and that everything afterwards was made on special, high quality commission by Royce, and all of them are designed as pretty standard magic user equipment with a bunch of stage performer flair. But that's not the only thing out of step here. Usually, when I'm talking about abilities, I have four to talk about, and one's the limit break, and I make a joke that it's not powered by Dynamis, because it never fucking is. Now, we don't have a limit break here, but we do have spells. We have 124 spells. That's too many, we can't cover them all. So we have to instead figure out a sampler, but I wasn't sure what. That's too many spells for me to even pick through. But then I realize someone else picked for me. So, let's lightning round through Martin's spells and learn what we can from and about our teacher. The full description will be up on screen for each one, so feel free to slow it down if you want. Mind Blast is essentially phantom wounds, tricking the target into thinking they've been hurt real bad. Thousand needles. They aren't real needles, but that doesn't make them hurt any less. Glower uses the eyes like an arcane sigil to fire lightning through them. Aqua Breath, if the mage using it is in any way competent, those bubbles are poisonous. It's also only used by Ultros and Leviathan, so even before we start the Blue Mage's Guild, Martin's either fought a Primal or a Void Scent that fights in the Colosseum. Missile, not a real missile, but a magical imitation of one. Despite the description saying it's a war marketer thing, it's only learnable from Enkidu, or the Guardian in the Sigmascape, so I don't know how to read Martin having that one. Flying Frenzy requires you to magically alter your own state of mind itself, and body slamming in the middle of the enemies is rough, so the spellbook recommends, you know, shields. Magic Hammer, I think just causes a straight up concussion. Weirdly, the description credits it to Biblos, but you can't learn it from him. Northerlies. Our first clear example that we're definitely imitating the spirit rather than the letter, Yetis do this with refrigerated spit, 
We just do it with a magic blizzard because we're lame. The first undeniably wild one, Quasar. It's falling stars, but our first real what the hell from Martin. Because this is just straight up clearly from Sophia, who canonically was only fought once in normal difficulty. So either he was with us for that, or he fought the extreme. Either way, wow. Eruption, fitting for its name, comes from manipulating fire beneath the earth into bursting forth from the ground. It's also only used by Ifrit, who's temper happy as hell, so maybe Martin's got the echo and nobody told us? Mountain Buster has a terminal case of exactly what it looks like, but it does tick up the amount of primals that Martin's apparently fought. Shock Strike from Ramu is even stronger than a lightning bolt and is compared to a warhammer smashing the ground. Honestly, I kinda thought the lightning was more powerful than the hammer, but I guess I've never been hit by either, so what do I know? Mighty Guard is actually the only totem given spell in this list, but it comes from deep sea fish in the indigo deep. It's essentially all power to shields, but in, like, ether form. One of the fan favorites, Self Destruct, gave the bomb void scent its namesake. And now we can do it by converting all of our ether into pure fire. The description also mentions its combo with Toad Oil, saying that it has the drawback of being more painful. But if you're dying anyway, who cares, right? This spell is the only one I wasn't 100% on, but I'm pretty sure it's Basic Instinct, an imitation of a wild Curl's ability to tap into raw survival instinct when their back's against the wall. Rose of Destruction is an imitation of an imitation. It's Ivon Curl Fist's adaptation of the monster ability Blaster, and that's not a primal, but that does mean that Martin fought Ivon Curlfist's ghost. Ethereal Spark isn't a super accurate term for what the spell actually does, which is huck a bunch of shiny sharp things that leave the target bleeding profusely. But I guess Diamond Dust was taken. Right Round conjures up a spiky boulder to imitate a Greater Armadillo, telling everyone to back the fuck off. The fact we haven't seen Greater Armadillos outside the first raises some questions about Martin. Pete Pelt is borrowed from the Mudmen in the Dravanian Hinterlands, and is exactly what it looks like. And apparently, the psychological damage of getting covered in mud is a legitimate part of its usefulness. And finally, Deep Clean is just what it looks like, an ethereally conjured broom. But its description explicitly says it's from the Seeker of Solitude. So by all evidence, yes, Martin has been to the first and just didn't tell us. So, there we have it. Blue Mage Law, which is only 10% tour roll, and 90% just one guy. If you like this, encourage me with YouTube buttons, and I'll leave you with a summary of everything we learned about Blue Mage. According to the series, we are too powerful, and possibly raised by wolves. According to the spells, Martin's had some wild vacations. And according to the job story, making money off what you love to do is fine, as long as you're not a dick about it. By the way, I'm turning on monetization for these videos, and I'll have a way to give money directly once I figure out which one's right for what I do. Thank you all so much, and I hope to see you all again real soon.